Coveted last slot of the day because you know this is the uh, the one where everybody's totally burnt out, and uh, I'll try to bring you guys back. So today, my name is Dan Walsh. If you haven't uh, uh, seen me speak before, I um, lead the container team at Red Hat. I've been Red Hat for about uh, just on just over 18 years, um, so I've been around forever. And I, as I said, I lead the container team, and we're going to be talking today um, about uh, Podman and um, about replacing Docker with Podman. I have a concert tickets at 7.30 tonight in Lowell, so we're gonna try to make this as quick as possible, okay? Because <laughs> it's gonna take me a while to get, if you don't know Massachusetts, Lowell is not close, and getting out of the city at this hour. So let's start out, um, we'll start out with the presentation right now. Next slide. So the first step you have to do is your DNF install Podman. Or you can take notes if you want. Okay, the next thing you do is alias docker equals podman. Okay, next. Any questions? Okay, I guess I'll make the show. Next slide. So back a year ago, back in May of 20, uh, May 29, 2008, a guy named Alan Moran tweeted out on uh, uh, on Twitter. I completely forgot that almost two months ago I said Alice Docker equals Podman, and it has been a dream. And then he uses my slogan, "No big fat demons." And uh, so down to here, Joe Thompson responds to him and said, what reminded you that you uh, had done that? And uh, the response by him is, I executed Docker help. <laughs> and of course, Podman help came up on the screen. Next slide. So at this point, I usually like to get everybody um, involved. So everybody, please stand up. Next. So please read out any text that is in. myself is Dan Quixote and someone actually saw this the first time I put up this slide and said no it's Don Quixote but that's the joke I'm Dan, Dan Quixote okay in case I have to explain these things out to you uh, you know I've been trying to actually I came in uh, how many people were at the last presentation Okay, in the last presentation. Oh, no, not my last presentation. Um, last presentation, the guy up here was talking. Uh, I, I came in the last few minutes, and he must have said Docker images, Docker containers. And every time he says that, it just sends shivers down my spine because it's like, Ugh. and I, so I have to control myself and say, yeah, you just mean images. You just mean uh, container images. You just mean, you know, these are just uh, our OCI images. Um, so, next slide. So let's talk about what it means to be a container, right? So uh, yeah, I'd like to level set uh, what it means to be, uh, what, do, what does it mean when I want to run a container? So I want to run a container. So just that statement, what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means to run a container is you have to identify what is a container or what do you mean when I say I want to run a container? So most people, when they say they want to run a container, they're talking about something that exists at a container registry. So they're gonna say, I want to run Nginx or I want to run Apache or I want to run or I want to run Alpine. And, and really what they're talking about there 
is this is, is a container image. Okay, and a container image happens to be a uh, basically you create a a directory on a disk, and you put some content in that directory, and that content looks like root. Okay, it's called a root FS. Okay, a root file system. Basically, if you went in there, you think usually you see see things like user slash bin and slash Etsy and things like that. So it looks like root on a Linux operating system. The next thing you need to do is you tie that up into a tarball. Okay, and then you create a JSON file, and the JSON file basically describes what's inside of the container. Okay, what's inside of that tarball? Usually it's things like entry points. Okay, what is the executable that I'm going to run when I run the container? Uh, environmental variables, maybe the working directory that you're going to use, and a few other fields, some labels that might describe the content, uh, what is the licensing, things like that. Uh, but there's like six or seven fields. And anybody that's ever played with the Docker file, you see those things like the working directory, the entry point, the command, those fields. Those are all the stuff that gets put into the JSON file. And this is the thing that Docker developed. The real breakthrough in Docker was they designed this container image, basically a way to take those tarballs, put them onto a web service, and allow you to pull those down, install them in your box, and run a container on top of that. Well, a company called CoreOS came along, um, this is before Red Hat purchased them, and they basically wanted to standardize the content of that JSON file. Right? They wanted to basically say, what do the fields inside of that JSON file mean and the location of the tarball? And they came, wanted to basically standardize that because they wanted to make sure that no one company controlled the standard of what was you know, this revolution of container images that are going on. Anybody in here of a, hear of a company called Microsoft? <laughs> okay, a few people raised their hands. Um, so Microsoft, before, you know, we used to hate them and now we love them, um, but you know, the relationships changed. But Microsoft, believe it or not, back in the day, people used to send emails to each other with this format called dot .doc. Okay, and the way you would write documents, you would write dot .docs. And what happened is Microsoft, in their wisdom, would change the format of dot .doc on every single release. So when you had Windows 95, you had dot .doc. Windows 97, you had dot .doc. And guess what it had? If you wrote a document in Windows 97 and sent it to someone on Windows 95, they couldn't look at it. But they could if they spent money at Microsoft to buy the latest software to be able to look at those documents. So every single time Microsoft released a new version of dot .doc, you had to upgrade your software. It was a brilliant marketing screen, okay? But that's because one company decided, not only that, but the open source competitors and other people that wanted to look at Dot .doc suddenly would be broken as soon as the new version came out, and then they'd be scrambling to try to figure out what was in the new Dot .doc. So you really never want to have one company control a standard interchange format right, like, like Dot .doc. And so CoreOS wanted to standardize on this so that just one company wouldn't control it, and they came out with a thing called the AppC spec, Application Container Specification. And they, they threw it out there and said, uh, we think we should standardize in this format. And suddenly, the container world, you know, everybody was rejoicing that we had a new way of shipping software on Linux, and it was a tarball and this JSON file, and suddenly there's a second type of JSON file. Right? There was a second specification. At that point, all the vendors got together and said, we can't have two ways of shipping these container images. We want to standardize in one way, so we have to form a standards body. And they did. They formed the standards body called OCI, Open Container Initiative. Okay, And the, comp the companies that were involved in that were Red Hat, CoreOS, Docker, IBM, Google, Microsoft, and a few other companies. Okay, all got together and formed the standards body that basically specified what that container image that sits at a container registry was going to be, and that's called the OCI image bundle format. So when I want to run a container, now I have a way of having a standard definition of what it means I want to run a container. The next thing I need to do when I run a container, oh, sorry, look, quick segue. Um, a couple of months ago, actually back, obviously, wearing a somewhat winter coat, uh, I went to a uh, restaurant in Boston, a, a takeout place, and I was wearing this jacket. And uh, the jacket, because I contribute to the Open Container Initiative, OCI, and the lady, the lady asked me at the counter, said if I was into having open containers of alcohol on the streets. <laughs> and I had to explain to her that OCI, Open Container Initiative, was something different than that. So 
anytime. So just remember this picture right here, okay? They're not the same thing. Next. Okay, so now I want to run a container. Um, so I need a way of getting that container image from the registry to my host. Um, and most people, if I asked you, how do you get uh, something from a container registry to your host, you would say, you would say the dreaded D word, right? You'd say D pull. And uh, so we, uh, a few years ago, um, we opened up a pull request with uh, Docker Inc. to um, our upstream Docker at, at the time, and we wanted to basically pull down just the JSON file associated with an image. So what we want to do is just pull down that JSON file so we can look at it, because those tabballs can get pretty big. I mean, those tabballs will get two, three, four gigabytes. So if you wanted to pull down, just look at an image onto your host, um, you'd have to pull down seven gigabytes, then look at the JSON file and realize, yeah, that's really not what I wanted, and now you have to get rid of it. So we thought it would be really nice just to pull down the JSON file, or the specification file, um, and we opened a pull request to Docker, and they rejected it because they said they didn't want to uh, make the command line interface any more complex. But they said, it's just a web service, just pull down the JSON file yourself, build, you know, basically do curl, a fancy version of curl. So we started working on a tool called Scopio. And Scopio um, basically implemented that protocol. But uh, Antonio Merdaka, who's one of the guys here, actually invented Scopio. And he basically continued working on it. So Scopio became a mechanism for moving images around. So copying images from different types of storage, from registry to registry, um, to the host, and everything else. But so, um, so that's the symbol of Scopio there. But Scopio eventually became, uh, was split into two pieces. So we wanted to have a library just for pulling images around, and then Scopio became the CLI on top of that. And that library is called GitHub Containers Image. So GitHub Containers Image has all the technology into, uh, available to interact with remote registries and local storage. So, um, so that's a library that we now use for our container tools. Next. So the next thing I want to do with the container, I identify the container, I have the ability to move that container to my local host, I need to install that software, that, that software on disk. Well, when I talked about the container images, I actually missed, I didn't quite def define the whole scope of what it means to be a container. Containers are layered, okay, they're, they're, think of a wedding cake, a very traditional American wedding cake where you have these layers. Uh, you might have a base layer, so sort of like the Fedora image, and then I might have Apache installed on top of that and then I might have JBoss installed on top of Apache and then I might have my app on top of the, that. So the way that works is I have the, the, the original um, tab wall that gets exploded on disk. Now I need to put a copy on write file system on top of that, explode in the Apache content, and then I put another copy on write on top of that, explode the um, JBoss app, and I end up with like sort of a four layer uh, wedding cake. And the, the mechanism in Linux to do that is using this thing called copy and write file systems. And we built a library um, to do that, and that's called GitHub Container Storage. And so Container Storage allows us to take a whole bunch of layers from a container registry, pull them down with containers image, and then store them on disk. And basically create that root FS that we need to finally execute the application. So con GitHub Container Storage includes things like overlay the file system, device mapper file system, butter FS. So there's different ways of doing this, and that's all I'm um, built in time to, inside of the library container storage. Last one. So the last thing I need to do when I want to run a container is I need to basically um, basically assemble the container and run a program to configure the Linux kernel to run the container. But when I want to run a container, there's, there's really three different people involved, so three different um, ways of getting data about what I'm going to run a container. So we have the original container image up here, which has the JSON file that describes the entry point and basically the environmental variables you want by default. The second entity that gets involved in running a container is the con what I call a container engine. Okay, Docker would be an example of that. But a container engine is basically has some hard-coded standards for what it means to run a container. Things like what SE Linux labels are going to be associated, what are the set comp rules are going to be, what namespaces are going to be used. And that's all sort of 
hard coded into the container engine when I want to run a container. <laughs> the last person is actually the human being or the container orchestrator. They have input into what it means to be run a container. So anybody that's ever run uh, a podman command or a Docker command has basically done things like you know dash dash v you know dash v mount this in or dash ti or drop this capability. All those commands you put on the command line. So we have input from the human or the orchestrator. We have basically the hard coded standards of the container engine, and then we have the image. All of those three inputs get combined together, and guess what? They create another JSON file. That JSON file describes what the user intends when he wants to run a container. And that gets dropped on disk, and that got standardized as well in OCI, and that's called the OCI runtime specification. So this has the SE Linux labels, the uh, namespaces, the capabilities, the C groups, all that data that gets uh, assembled into it gets dropped into an OCI uh, in, uh, runtime spec. And then the container engine launches a tool to configure the Linux kernel to run the container. The default implementation of that is called Run C. Every container engine in the world right now, by default, uses Run C. Docker uses it. All the tools of Red Hat ships use Run C. So the, basically, at the last step, everybody drops an OCI specification and then executes Run C, which reads that data. Now there are other, are other runtimes that uh, out there, like C Run, as well as Kata containers. G Visor, but basically they were all OCI's, and this was all standardized. So we have the ability to identify a container image, pull it from the storage, pull it, store it, and then run it. Next slide. Okay. Oh, I forgot about this one. So that's fine. You can go forward. Um, so we also have to be able to set up the networking. So the networking, when I want to run a container, and that actually was standardized also by CoreOS. And CoreOS developed this thing called CNI, Container Network Interface. And that allows us to have different vendors come in and give us different isolation networks. So different ways of setting up virtual private networks, like Flannel, Weave. Um, a lot of vendors have, have implemented some of these. Last, you know, the very last thing we need is we need a way of monitoring a container. So when run C, run C just goes out to the kernel and sets up the container and basically does a fork and exec and the container is running on the system. But we really need a process that sits out there and watches what the container is doing. Basically holds, basically waits for it to exit so it can get its exit code. Did it fail? Did it not fail? It holds open its logging. So when it writes logs, it's going to write this. There's a little C, pro, C program called Conmon, Container Monitor, that sits out there and watches the container. Holds open its standard in, standard out, and standard error. And that allows us, that's a tool that we can connect back to to get back to the container. So each container has a con, Container Monitor running with it. Next slide. So what don't we need when we're running a containers? And this is my big, you know, another Don Quixote thing. We don't need a big fat container daemon. Okay, we don't need a daemon running his root on the system that everybody shares together. Right? This is what this is one of my fundamental problems with the Docker daemon is that here we are six, seven years into container revolution, and the only way to run containers is a big fat running daemon that everybody shares. And it becomes a bottleneck for anybody doing any type of, of evolution of containers. Okay, so all the tools we're going to be talking about, the, or the Podman tool we're about to talk about, doesn't have any daemon, and we're going to demonstrate that next. So think about Docker as basically this one all-encompassing tool that does all the features. But think about what what we want. We want to be able to run containers. We want to be able to build containers. Um, and we want to move containers around. So what really what a lot of the effort of well, what I've been working on, our team's been working on, is basically to take what was done in one big fat container daemon and break them into individual components to be able to do that on a system. Next. Oop, next. I'm actually on the wrong time. Okay. That shouldn't have been there. Wrong presentation. Okay. So, uh, so introducing, so one of the tools we built, you know, originally was a tool called Podman. And uh, Podman is a tool for managing pods and containers. Pods are a Kubernetes concept. Basically, a pod is a group of one or more containers all running in the same group of namespaces, same C group environments. So Podman stands for pod manager, but it also just manages containers. 
But when we were designing Podman, what we did is we knew that you guys are going to Google, how do I do this with a container? And what you're going to be faced with as soon as you say that is you're going to get a Docker command line. Okay, when you say, how do I mount a volume? How do I turn off SE Linux? How do I do this? And the, how do I, that's all going to come up with a Docker command line. So we decided to just take advantage of that command line and implement it itself. So next. So to list containers, next. To run containers, to exec into a container to look at the images container. So basically we copied the Docker CLI, basically use the same commands, and that's why we say you can alias. But this is, this is too boring to believe, so I'm gonna go in and actually demonstrate it live. Is that big enough? Is that big enough? And I'm not supposed to be rude, okay. So let's start this up. This is when I type my password on the screen. Okay, so this is, uh, um, by the way, all of our demos, any demo you're going to see today, tomorrow, that has anything to do with Podman or Builder or anything else, are all at GitHub containers slash demos. So the script I'm running, you can take it home, run it on your own uh, uh, laptop, get it set up, and it should all work. Uh, so right now I'm going to run Podman version. It looks very much like Docker version. Uh, but yeah, Podman, um, uh, Podman uh, info is the command that I find mu much more interesting. So uh, Podman info basically dumps out all the information about what's going on when I'm running a pod. Uh, but there's a couple of interesting things here. Um, we look at the, uh, the bottom part of this. I wish I had a, a display, but I, maybe I'll do it this way. So we're looking at the store here. Um, so it shows you know, where the store configuration is, but down here we show you that we're running the overlay driver um, on the system, and it shows that the storage is being stored in uh, BioLive container storage. Uh, but it gives you an idea of, of what's going on. But let's um, go up a little bit. So this is an interesting section right here. This is registries. So one of, the, one of the things that we did not get along with Docker about was Docker wanted to hard code everybody in the world to use Docker IO. Okay, and we felt right from the beginning that we wanted to allow multiple registries, okay, to allow you to store your images wherever you wanted in the system. Um, and so we, um, and right from the tools, all of our tools support the yeah, concept of multiple registries. So in this case, you see that I have Docker IO, Fedora Project, Quay.io, uh, Red Hat One, CentOS One. Um, all set up. We also allow you to block uh, container registry. So if you want to be able to say, I don't want anybody pulling from Red Hat, I don't know why we need to do that, but you know, you could block um, anybody uh, pulling images from any, any of the individual registries. Um, so let's let's go in. So uh, one of the things, you know, again, we don't have any demons running on this thing. But one of the interesting things we can start to do with containers, um, and, you know, I gave a talk yesterday on Builder, and Builder is another tool in the, in the same group. Uh, one of the things we can do is we actually can run containers inside of containers. So this this example right here is I'm going to run Podman command, and inside of it I'm going to be running. Um, well, it's running uh, build a bud. So this is actually going to be a container, building a container image inside of a container locked down. Okay, and this is the simple Docker file we're going to use to do it. It's pulling down an image. BU has a very nice network to run this with. So I pulled down an Alpine image, then I built a, an image on top of it, and I called it my, um, my image. So I pulled down this image, built on top of it, and that all happened within a lockdown container. So you can imagine running containers, say, inside of a thing like Kubernetes, having distributed, distributed Kubernetes building hundreds of container images. So imagine your CI CD system, and this is without leaking any Docker socket or any access to the host system. We've totally isolated these containers to be able to build containers. So at this point, we're going to remove the containers from the system. 
and that's really cool, but that really just looks like what Docker can do, right? Yeah, so that's yeah, somewhat interesting building containers inside of containers. But the really cool thing with, with Podman now is I can actually run it rootless. So those first few commands I was running uh, with sudo in front of them. So this now I'm running these commands without um, sudo. So I'm actually pulling a container image. I just pulled down the Alpine image into my home directory. And I just ran a command. So that actually ran a container. I just listed the top level of the Alpine image. But it basically ran a container in my home directory with no privileges at all. So this is a standard user account. There is no additional privileges going on. I can show you the images, the containers inside of my home directory. Here's the images inside of my home directory. Um, now I'm going to show you the images um, on the root system. If you notice quickly, uh, they're different. So basically, my home directory storage in, in you know, the container images are being stored directly in my home directory and that's different than what's being stored on the, the root system. So let's take a quick look at how we're doing that. What is the magic of running rootless uh, Podman or rootless builder? Um, so what we're doing is we're taking advantage of user namespace. So user namespace is this really uh, cool feature um, in Linux that almost no one's ever used before. And Podman is probably the first tool when you start to play with it that you're ever going to use it with. Um, so user namespace allows us to configure these files at CWAD CW, at and at CSubGID. And I'm going to show you what they look like. So here we're going to show, this is at CSubUID. And actually, you actually have an entry in my... Uh, my version. But basically, so here's my account. So inside of Etsy subuid, I have a D Walsh line, and this line has starts at 100,000 and then allocates the next 65,000 UIDs into it. So out of the box, uh, in uh, RHEL 8 and in uh, Fedora Ubuntu, right now, Shadow Utils, every time you add a user, allocates 65,000 UIDs to the user. Um, and as you see, I did an Ashley account afterwards, and that started at uh, uh, you know, basically 100,065 um, and then the next 65,000 UIDs. So now I'm going to execute a, a command builder on share, but there is a podman on share. I just got to fix the. Uh... So I just became uh, root on the system. So inside of this, let's take a quick look at uh, uh, my account. And if you look at my home directory here, I have all the directory, all the files inside of my home directory are owned by root. Now, I claim to be a security guy. Does that seem like a smart thing to do in my home directory? All right. You know, am I running as root? Well, I am in this home directory right now. But if I exit the container and I go over to here, basically, same exact directory. And look at the directory here, you'll see that everything is owned by D. Walsh. So with the magic that's going on here is I've entered a user namespace, and I'll show you what the kernel basically says about this. It shows you this mapping here. So down here, uh, I don't know if I, maybe I'll raise it up a little bit. So up here, it basically says that my UID happens to be 3267. So inside of the user namespace, Podman or, or Builder is mapped UID 0. Root inside of my namespace, inside of my container, is going to be mapped to 3267 for a range of one UIDs. Then it looks to SC sub UID and says, starting at UID 1, map 100,000 and then the next 65,000 UIDs. So this container, or this uh, uh, user namespace now, I have control over 65,537 UIDs. And that's what's allocated to my system. My system. So let's look at what, what I can do with this. Um, so what I can do here is I can actually make der uh, foo, and I'm going to touch foo bar, and then I'm going to do a chone of bin colon bin Okay, so now I've created in my home directory a foo by directory and I have it owned by bin. So now we're going to exit out of the user namespace and I'm going to do an ls of l foo. Let's go, let's go up here. 
in a creative, remember I did, I choned it to bin, bin, which is bin inside of Etsy password is actually 1-1. One, one. So it actually created a file in my home directory owned by 100,000 and group 100,000. If, as a user here, I try to remove that, that file, I'm going to get permission denied because my user account, my user that's not in the username space, does not have access to those U, uh, UIDs. So this user, even though it's you know I created the file using my account, I'm not able to delete it. Now, if I go back into the username space or the container, I can actually remove the file. I'll just do that. So. So now let's, okay, so that's, that explains a little bit how Podman runs is rootless, right, taking advantage of that. But let's look at some other powers of, of user namespace. And Podman's really the, tool, the first tool to take full advantage of user namespace. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to run a container. Now I'm back to running it as sudo, but in this case I'm going to run it as sudo, but I'm giving it a UID map. So I'm going to say run the sleep, I'm just running the sleep program inside of a container, and I'm going to run it with a user UID map, a user namespace map, starting at 100,000, and I'm allocating 5,000 UIDs to it. I'm going to run the container, and there's a really cool feature of Podman. Um, one clever crowd yelled out 100,000 when they saw it, but you guys weren't clever. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, Podman Talk has the ability to show me what's going on inside the container as well as what's outside the container. So that user, H user, says show me the user inside the container and show me the host user. So that means I'm running as root inside the container, but I'm, my UID really on the process is 100,000. If I look for the sleep program on there, you'll see it is running as 100,000 down here. Now I'm going to run a second container, but this second container I'm going to run starting at UID 200,000. Okay, so the first one was running as UID 100,000, the second one's running as UID 200,000. There is process running on the system. If this container breaks out of the containment and gets onto the host, it's going to be treated as UID 200,000. So if it attacked, the first container was running as 100,000, you'd have standard UID separation in that, you know, if you ran multi-user systems over the years, the most basic of Linux security means that those UIDs cannot attack each other, right? They're, they're prevented from attacking each other by UID protection. So let's look at another thing. So there's a, there's a uh, thing in the operating system, it's been there many years, called logging UID. How many people in this room have ever heard of logging UID that have not seen me talk before? One person back there has seen or heard of logging UID. Well, logging UID was actually added, added by, for the United States government, okay, and basically for the auditing system. So it's all part of the standards auditing. I gave the same presentation in front of Department of Defense, people who required this to be put in, and I had about as many people respond to me that they've heard of logging UID as we just had here, sadly. So what logging UID actually does, it's really kind of neat, is when you log into the system, there's a field in the kernel that says that this process is going to be owned by that user. So when I log into the system, it says my, this, my logging UID for that process is 3267. From that point on, no matter what I do on the system, it will be recorded. So here I am running sudo, so I'm becoming root. Then I'm executing another program, podmin. That's launching a container. It's catting proc self UID inside of the container, and it comes back and says 3267 to this. Okay? Now I do the exact same thing with Docker. And Docker comes back, the exact same command, and Docker comes back with this huge number. Okay, that huge number there happens to represent minus one in a 64-bit operating system. That means that basically any process when you boot up a system that is not started by a user that logged into the system will have a login UID of minus one. Okay, basically says that no user ever started this. It was started by the boot system. So in this case, 
Why is that important? Well, I'm going to turn on auditing, and that audit command right there tells me to watch Etsy Shadow. I'm watching for anybody modifying Etsy Shadow. Now I'm going to simulate breaking out of a container, but I'm going to do a podman run privileged, and then I'm going to use a dash V that mounts the host operating system at slash into the container, and then I'm going to touch the file host slash Etsy Shadow, which is the host Etsy Shadow file. Now if I look at the auditing system to see who modified Etsy Shadow, it comes out and says D. Walsh modified Etsy Shadow. So there's something in the audit log that's the security of the system is basically saying Dan Walsh is the one that modified the Etsy Shadow. Now I'm going to do the exact same command with Docker. And Docker says unset modified Etsy Shadow. So if anybody's ever seen me, I always tell you that access to the Docker socket is the most dangerous thing you can do in a Linux system. Okay, it's more dangerous than giving out the root password to the system, and it is more dangerous than sudo without root. That is because when I log on to the system, I can do things through the Docker daemon that it cannot be recorded and not audited, and when I'm done dealing with the Docker daemon, I can actually destroy the container and destroy the fact that I, Dan Walsh, ever talked to the Docker daemon. Right? That can get eliminated from the log files by default, just by destroying the container that did it. So a couple, we showed a little bit of Podman top features before. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more. I showed you a host, I, host um, user and uh, host PID. I mean, root user and host user inside of the container. Now I'm showing you the PID namespace. So this says the PID inside the container for that sleep program is one, but it's really that process ID on the system. If I want to see if SE Linux is affected and what the labels are associated with the container, I can show a label. I can show seccomp, show you whether or not it's running with seccomp. And the last one is, is this, thing, this idea of capabilities. So the ability to break uh, the power of root, even though it's root running inside of the container, I've actually taken away of a lot of the power of root, and these are the default list of capabilities that are left on, and these were standardized by Docker. Okay, these are things that are hard-coded into Docker and that nobody ever knows about. So these are the default capabilities that all containers run by default. If you were running with Cryo, we were running with a much smaller subset of these, of these um, capabilities. And some of these have some funny historical significance of why they were done. This one right here, I think, is shockingly bad. And really, I should turn it off in Podman, but we wanted Podman to have the equivalent security of Docker, have the, you know, so the equivalent capabilities. So this one right here, audit write, that allows a process in the container to write to the auditing subsystem. Do you know why that's there? Because when people first started dealing with containers, they wanted to put SSH daemon inside of the container. All right, because they believed that you would SSH into a directly into a container. And it turns out SSH daemon needed to be able to write, right, when I log into a system, it records the fact that Dan Walsh logged in, and that has to get written to the auditing daemon. So it needed the audit write. So someone at Docker said, oh, well, if people are running SSH daemon, we might as well just turn on the ability to audit write. Now almost no one in the world turns on that, but we still have that as a default turned on. Another interesting one down here is called NetRaw. NetRaw is actually very dangerous to allow on in containers. Um, NetRaw allows you to create IP packets in any form and send them out on, the, on your internet device. I, it's been shown um, the ability to do that has broken some of those um, VPNs that I talked about earlier, the things from CNI. Um, do you know why that's on? So you can ping. So you can create an ICMP packet. Well, there's other ways in Linux to send out ICMP packets, but we went with that default, a, a very insecure fault, default, just so you could be inside of a container able to execute the ping command. So some of these things are just like, eh, why do we have these? But lastly, this one drives me crazy, and that's make node. That allows you to create device nodes while you're inside the container. Now we have things like uh, name, uh, the name, uh, 
device C group and other ways of controlling what you're able to do, but, but if we could just eliminate that and just make the container engine provide the device nodes, we could actually run the containers more secure. But those are things you have to think about. And if you ran cryo, if you run under Kubernetes cryo, we eliminate that, we eliminate make node, we eliminate net raw, um, and we I think we eliminate sys to root. There's some weird ones that, you know, it's just all about running containers in production. But at least we reveal to you what you're actually running in the containers. So the last thing I'm going to show you with um, pods, uh, Podman is we talk about pods. And so here I'm going to create a pod. And what a pod is, is again, one or more containers. So I executed pod create, and I created a, a pod up there, and then I added a couple of containers to it. And so what I can do with that is I show you I have no containers running, and now I'm going to start the pod. So when I start the pod, it actually goes out and it actually creates two containers. So the containers started up simultaneously when I created the pod. So it's a way of associating multiple containers to the single um, namespace. And I could put 100 containers in there if I wanted. And then if I stop the pod, it shows you that there are no containers running on the system anymore. So that's the end of the demo. Let's get back quickly to the presentation. OK, so Podman. Podman, it came out um, about a year ago, a um, year and a half ago now, and Rel8 just came out, and we've decided in Rel8 to drop all support for Docker. So if you want to run containers, OCI containers, from the command line inside of Rel8, you'll have to use Podman and our other tools. And so up here, inside the documentation, Docker's not included in Rel8. For working with containers, use Podman, Builder, Scopio, and Run C tools. So we basically, Red Hat has moved away. If you want to use Docker, you'll have to go to Docker Inc. to get um, Docker from now on. So there will be no support for that. So uh, let's take a look at you know, some other advantages of, of Podman. It has proper integration with systemd. Basically, you can run systemd inside of a container. This was always a sticking point with Docker. They never liked the idea of running systemd inside of a container, but it turns out that that's a fairly common use case. So we realize when you're running systemd, and we will set it up so that it'll run by default out of it. Uh, we support SD Notify. This has to do with the fork exec model. Um, in the uh, Docker world, it always was hard to get better integration with systemd because if you ran the Docker command line inside of a unit file, that actually was talking out to a different daemon that was running in a different unit file to actually run the container. Um, so things like SD Notify. SD Notify is a way for the processes inside of the container to notify systemd that they're fully up and running. So for instance, if you were running a database and it might take a minute to actually get loaded before um, it wants to get any calls from anybody else, there's a, there's a way to tell systemd that I am fully up and, and ready to process data. And um, so that doesn't work with Docker, but it will work with um, Podman. Uh, socket activation, so the ability to basically have your service not running, but if a process, if a, if a, uh, a packet comes to a circuit socket, then systemd will kick off your container and, and the container get handed the socket to run. Um, Podman also has a full remote API. It's called Violink, and this allows you to run remote commands against Podmans. It also allows us to build Python bindings. So we can have, you can actually write Python code that will talk to um, Podman and actually execute Podman um, commands uh, via a, pod, uh, a Violink um, process. Um, that's what the remote API support is. Uh, we're also uh, just now releasing what we call Podman Remote. So this is a basically the exact same Podman command line, but instead of acting locally, it actually talks remotely to another Podman service. So basically, it can go to a remote machine over SSH and launch a Podman service on there and have it execute the commands. So from a one machine, you could do a Podman images, and on another machine, basically, you know read the images from that and send it back over an SSH connection uh, back to it. So why is that significant? Obviously, we're 
Um, the, the idea here is we want to get to Mac and Windows support, so there's now a Mac version available of Podman that can talk remotely to a Linux box, right? containers are a Linux concept, so you have to, even though you're sitting on a Mac box, you can talk to a Linux box and have it run the Podman commands, um, but give you the feel that you're running them locally, even though it's, it's running on top of, say, a VM or inside of the cloud. Um, we have full cockpit support for Podman. Cockpit is the, the GUI interface or a web interface into managing um, Fedora, RHEL, uh, just about every uh, operating system now use, supports Cockpit, so it's a web interface to manage uh, Linux operating systems, and it uses Node.js that's talking to Podman, uh, again, over the BioLink socket. So what don't we support? Um, so there's certain things that we can support in Podman and certain things we don't. Uh, we don't support auto start. So uh, th there's a concept in Docker that you can basically say, I want this container to auto start when the Docker daemon starts. Well, we ain't got a daemon, so there's no way for us to auto start. Well, we do have a daemon. It's called the init system. So our services that run in containers will start the same way every service that runs on a Linux system will start. You put the Podman command in a unit file in systemd at boot time, will start the service. We do have restart capability, so if the container goes down for any reason, you can set it set it to uh, restart. We do have a command, I shouldn't say propose, there is a podman generate system D, so we can take, after you execute a few containers or pods on your system, you can actually say, generate me a system D unit file that will run the container that's currently running on my system, so you can do it. We don't support Docker Swarm. So there is no Podman Swarm, right? We're in the Kubernetes camp. We believe Kubernetes won the orchestration war, so we want to integrate fully into um, Kubernetes. Uh, we currently don't have any support for notary. So we do support a thing with concept we call simple signing, which is basically GPG keys for signing images. Uh, we have nothing against notary. It's just not in something that uh, you know my team's willing to invest. If Podman's a fully open source um, project, if someone wants to build notary support, open up pull requests to get notary support in, we would we would to totally take it, but as of this time, no one has asked us, no one has opened up a pull request to get uh, notary in. Uh, significantly, we don't support the Docker API, so uh, there is no, and we have no plans to support that. We do have VARLink for our remote API, but you know there is no Podman socket for people who want to talk Docker um, from a Docker client to a, um, to a Podman. Uh, we do have partial Podman volumes support, um, but that's getting stronger all the time. We do support all the standard volumes for mounting it, but, but Docker had this concept of, of what they call Docker volumes, and these are like advanced daemons that Docker would interact with. Interact, interact with. Um, we, will, we are building that in. Finally, we don't support Docker Compose. Um, there is open source project right now called Podman Compose, so they're actually supporting it. The problem with Docker Compose, for our, from our point of view, is it's just way too big, right? There's way too many different ways, and if we had support Podman Compose, then we think we'd get an everlasting list of bug reports. But we do have the concept, we want to plug Podman directly into the Kubernetes world, and so we want to be able to, we have Podman Generate Kube and Podman Play Kube, and the goal here is to take a few running containers that you may set up with Podman, and you can take those and generate Kubernetes YAML files based on that, and take the Kubernetes YAMLs and basically inject them directly into OpenShift or into any Kubernetes environment and have your container go in from sort of the traditional way you did it with Docker into a full OpenShift. So make it easy for you to do that. Ought to take the YAML again from Kubernetes world and move it back into Podman. There is a lot of effort going on in the Ansible world to integrate uh, with Podman. Um, there's a tool that's actually called Ansible Podman, which is all about integrating with uh, Podman. So at this point, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Um, here's a whole bunch of links, this mailing list, everything else. So podman.io should be a central source for getting information. Do I have any questions? And I got about 10 minutes before I have to start running to the, see the Beach Boys. Because <laughs> they might not live until I get back. <laughs> any questions? Everybody thinks this is awesome. Okay, yes. Uh, what, do you, what are the next steps with Podman development? What are you guys 
Uh, well, we're finishing the, the well, there's, there's a few main um, challenges. We want to finish up the Windows and Mac support to get full Podman, boot to Podman um, support. We want to get uh, CoreOS involved in that so we could talk directly from Podman on a Mac to a CoreOS instance and get that to be seamless. Right now, you can actually install Podman, but you have to set up the SSH connection. You have to have the remote host running it. We want to make that more seamless. Uh, C Groups v2 support. Uh, right now, Podman root list doesn't support C Groups. That's because C Groups v1 can't be used that way. So we want to move to C Groups v2. Um, any other major things, you guys? Shout out. Okay, go ahead. How far do you want to go and support any like Docker uh, cube fly and Docker cube generate? Well, I don't do anything with Docker, but uh, pod, pod, pod. Yeah. how far do I want to go? Yeah, like how many features? Like we, we, I mean, we, there's, there's not many features we would we would deny. Now, again, we're not building Podman into a Kubernetes competitor. What our goal is is to be able to take Kubernetes stuff and, and allow you to play around with it in sort of the traditional container on the host rec world and move it back and forth. But pretty much we, we want to take any Kubernetes YAML file and be able to translate it into something that would run locally and then to take our stuff and translate it out. Now there's there's other things that Kubernetes does that we're not really, you know, we're not gonna you know duplicate. We're not going cross nodes, we're not, you know, dealing with any of that stuff. Uh, but would you support like say different big maps? Um would we? <laughs> Yes, I mean, if you open up a pull request, we'd be very uh, welcoming to it, okay? Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so I'd like you all to go home, download Podman onto your favorite operating system. When RHEL 7.7 uh, will finally have support for rootless Podman, but it had uh, support for root, 7.6 has support for root, um, root running Podman. Um, that was more about updating the operating system to have all the features that we need in it. Um, and RHEL 8 out of the box does. Fedora runs on Ubuntu, Debian, just about every uh, distribution out there right now has Podman on it. Okay, thanks for having me and I'm running. <laughs>